All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Um, I'm just going to check in the chat to make sure that I can see everybody and everything. All right. So hello and welcome. Um, today, I am going to be interviewing Annie Morton of Annie Morton Designs. And so hopefully her face will pop up soon on the screen. So feel free to, to join me, um, Annie, if you'd like. And so for this um, third, third episode or third edition of Fiberside Chat, I'm going to be interviewing and asking Annie some questions today. So thank you so much for everybody that is joining us during the live. Um, feel free to put any comments or questions that you have in the comment area, and I will read them um, after at the end so that if you have any questions for, for Annie, you can, you can ask them. Okay, so um, just as a recap too, though, from the last Fiberside chat, I had interviewed Marjorie Erickson of Opalescent Studio. So if you would like to see any of the previous interviews, you can just go into the Wool and Fiber Arts group and then search the hashtag Fiberside chat, and then it should pop up all of the videos. So all of these interviews will be um, accessible if you're not able to make them during the live, so you'll be able to go back and, and check them out. So without further ado, welcome and thank you so much for joining me today, Annie. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Okay. All right. So, um, so yeah, so I'm just going to ask a couple of questions and then I'll go check the, the comments and, and see if there's any questions there. So um, my first question, since I'm trying to get to know people that are part of the wool and fiber arts community a little bit better, can you just let the people know and myself know too, um, what type of fiber arts are you into and, yeah. and just give us a little background about yourself? Sure. So I am actually a retired evolutionary biologist and ecologist, and I started sewing when I had young kids as a kind of a identity thing while I had my job and I had my kids. It's like, oh, I need something that's me. And so I started sewing about probably at this point, 12 to 13 years ago and started my sewing studio. Um, after the third kid, my husband and I realized that it was cheaper to, for me to stay home. And this is the story of every mom, right? Cheaper for me to stay home than it was for me to keep working. And we also decided we were in Seattle and it was not a, an economically great place for us to be with young kids. So we moved to East Tennessee where I'm originally from, um, but kind of in a different little area. We're right up in the mountains in a place called Athens. And we started a little fiber farm because I've always been interested in fiber and weaving and everything like that. And I have a skirt, a herd of, we call them the flurd because it's a flock and a herd of scratch and dent down on the luck and ready for retirement, um, sheep and goats and their Angora crosses and Shetland and Shetland cross sheep. And so I sew is my main thing, and I have been for about 12 or 13 years now. And then for about the last five or six years, I've been um, spinning. I've been harvesting the fiber from animals. I've been spinning. And then I do something called continuous strand weaving. I need to do a demo video of this because it's a little different. It's, it's if you don't have a lot of room or if you have children running around everywhere, it's like a picture frame you can stick on the wall, and then you just weave, and it warps and wefts at the same time. And so I do that. So that's that's all my fiber stuff is the sewing the spinning and the weaving yeah that that, that sounds like um a really big shift and and lifestyle change to go from you know seattle and then to go back right. to where you're home so it was um part of that because you wanted to get into the fiber mm -hmm. arts more or yeah yeah we'd actually um before I moved out of Seattle, we built a little, we had a, we miraculously had a, almost half an acre and we built a little goat shed in the back. And I was like, I'm getting two Angora goats and I'm putting them back there. And my husband was like, let's just go get a farm. <laughs> so it was a big shift, but I'd always been kind of interested in fiber arts. My mom was um, a weaver. She did kind of a freestyle weaving of the 60s and 70s. And her mom before her was actually an extension agent for um, Home Ec is what they used to call it. But they've got a different name for it now. But she was a, a wool braider. She braided wool rugs and she sewed and she painted. And she was, she'd probably be 100 now. By the time she had like a, a master's degree in education and things like that. So I come from a long line of fiber artists, as well as always being interested in it myself. So now, now I know you said you have um, three children. So do they find um, the fiber arts interesting too? Do they want to touch and make things with the things that you have yeah. in your studio? 
so my oldest tells me all the time he's my number one fan um <laughs> but he's also one of those gentle sweet like kermit in human form he's just like a gentle sweet soul so i could be doing anything and he would be my number one fan um my my youngest who is a wild child really likes spinning and so i'll give him a drop spindle or i'll let him i'll stop treadling my spinning wheel i have in ashford and i'll let him spin it for me it makes for some art yarn but it's okay and then my daughter is really interested in the fabric and the sewing she's she's got a great eye for color and design um so she's really interested so they're all interested in different parts of it and of course they all love the animals so yeah no that that sounds like um a wonderful space for them to be creative and that yeah. you're 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 open to them enjoying it with you you know so mm -hmm. um i know just even myself as a teacher that if you give students textile fibery things mm -hmm. whether like you said with your with your son and the spinning wheel or fabric right. just the idea of um having that sensory input it can be very calming and and quieting yeah. um to, to to children too so that's that's wonderful that you you share that with them yeah i give them my um I give them my little scraps and they make collages. They make really cool collages. Extra oh, that's collages. cool. I, do, if you have pictures of any of them, would you um, be able to come back <laughs> sure. and, and post them in the comments so that we can see? Sure. I'm, I'm always a fan of, of how um, children interpret, you know, art with, with fibers. So I'd, I'd, yeah. I'd love to see it. Okay, so um, because you do use like fibers and, and fabric, mm -hmm. is there a certain um, fabric that you enjoy using? Sure. So my claim to fame as a seamstress in, in the bag making world is I use these really beautiful woven jacquards. Wow. And when I had kids that were little and light enough for me to carry, I don't know if anybody else has ever seen it. They, women use these or, and men and everybody else use these really beautiful seven meter long, six meter long woven, they call them wraps. And they basically just straight jacket their children to their bodies. And it's a really way, great way to be connected to your child and have them, you know, not ask me to be up, but also still have your hands. So I got into that community when I started having kids and I realized there were a lot of scrap pieces that came out of that, um, as well as what they would call a retired wrap, which is a wrap that has a structural flaw or that, you know, somebody's just done using and they don't need anymore. So I use those and I piece them together. And this is actually today's project. This is from a company called OSHA Slings. And this is today's project. And I piece them together and I make my almost all my products feature some of that wrap scrap. Um, which is just a really great way to integrate really beautiful woven fabrics into my So, heart. So what you're using is actually like waste from the companies that make it, or do you yeah. like source it from, you know, moms that are done using them or? Yes, both. So this okay. is what they, this is waste. So a lot of them, these wow. things have what they call a taper on the end. And okay. so they, they chop the ends off and then you end up with a taper. And so wow. instead of a blunt end, so you can tie a tidy little knot at the end when you're straight jacketing your baby to yourself. And so I will, I will basically quilt these. There's a quilting style called crazy quilting where you just yeah. kind of, yeah. Okay. So it's based very loosely or very actually closely. My mom's a quilter on crazy quilting. So I'll crazy quilt these things together and make bigger pieces of fabric with them. And that's what I do with like the waste material. Or a lot of these companies have gotten to know me enough that they'll sell me a meter. They're like, would you like a meter as opposed to scavenging? You know? and I'm like, yeah, sure. So a lot of the companies will sell me a meter or I source from moms who are done and, and you know, they've got huge amounts of money invested in these wraps. And they're like, I don't need a seven foot you know, or seven meter piece of fabric around my house and I'll buy it from them um, and, and make it into all of my different bags and accessories. And so what, what, is the 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 blend of the fabric it, from the pictures? I mean, it looks like it's silk. Is it is it silk? So this one is silk. I think okay. this one's silk and hemp, and often cotton. This is a company called OSHA, and they source the most amazing fabrics. They do do they do um, piece silk, eerie silk. They'll do cottons. They do hemp. They do linens. They do all sorts of amazing stuff. And all these different fabrics have different. You know this as a fiber artist have different qualities and so when you're wrapping these babies to you they've got ones that can hold a little bitty baby squishy to you you know so those are super soft things like sea island cotton and, and silk and stuff like that but then when your kids get to be chunky like mine did you kind of shift up to hemp and linen because they've got a lot more grip so you can tie that knot and that knot's gonna knot and that knot's gonna like hold as opposed to like, i can't hold a toddler so you shift with them 
So all the different wraps have all different things. They make wool ones. There's a lot of cash wool. There's a lot of merino. OSHA uses Shetland, which makes me happy because those are, those are the things I do. Um, this is another one. This one's all cotton. And this is from a company I, I work with called Pretty Paisley. So it just depends. And it depends on what the weaver wants to do. I don't, I don't make the, the, the yarn decisions or the, the fiber decisions. I let the company do that. And yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that, that to me is amazing that you're taking something that would probably go into the landfill, right? Or that would just be yeah. you know, thrown away. And, and you're basically creating art and giving it new life and, and repurposing it. So I think that that part is phenomenal, especially because the um, materials that you're talking about that are going into it are mostly what I would refer right. to as like luxury fibers, right? So to think that they're going you know, to waste, that's, that's awesome. Do you have any examples? Cause I know you said crazy quilting. Do you have any examples maybe of like the fabric you put together that's not actually in the bag form yet? I don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot if you don't but I'm just curious to see what they, what they look like. Cause I'm, I'm really into crazy quilting. I, I just finished right. one last year that was you know, right. all done by hand. So I'm, I'm curious to see what kind of fabrics you have and put together. How about I put one in the a couple in the yeah, comments? Yeah. Sure. Because they, they tend to sell really fast. Um, okay. So I make them and then I post them and they sell. I was thinking, I don't think I have a single thing. I've got like 10 things left from this weekend and that's kind of it. So I'll, but I'll post well, that, pictures. That, that's in the a good problem too. then. Right, exactly. So that yeah, that would be awesome because I would I would love to see um even I don't I don't I don't know if you have it, but like if you have like stages of what it looks like. So um yeah. is there a way that you because you're saying they're all different fibers, so you just basically put them together, or do you tend to group for like a project where you have like your silk pile and then your cotton right. and stuff like that? So I tend to I do a couple different things. One of the things I'll do is group by color. Okay. Um, and so, and that makes it a little easier. A lot of times, so this, this company will sell me this much at once, or maybe even more. And sometimes they'll have different patterns. This one is a floral pattern. Um, but in this same, on the same warp, they wove also some foxes and some stars and a few other things. And so I will, what I'll, a lot of times I'll do is group all of those things together. So there are all these different patterns on the same warp that I'll then make into a bag together. Oh, or in wow. this case, this case, this is a floral one specifically. So I picked out all of the flower ones and I'm gonna make these into a bag. So yeah, it just, it very much depends on the project. That's, and, that, and that's so interesting too, that you kind of have to see what you get, you know, it's kind of a mystery, mm -hmm. yeah. um, what, what they make and what's popular. Cause I'm sure there's different like color trends and pattern mm -hmm. trends, you know, when they have like seasonal, like spring lines and things like that. I know I tried to do the whole baby wearing thing with my son. Cause he was the kind of baby that never wanted to be put down, but also he didn't like to be restricted. So it was always like the mm -hmm. facing outward, you know, yeah. so that he could experience the world, but he wanted to just yeah. flail his body. So the baby thing didn't work. And I definitely had a couple of those. So it would have been great to know that there was someone like you that I could take fabric that I wasn't sure about what yeah. to do. As a matter of fact, I think I have some extra crazy quilts, um, <laughs> scraps. So I'm happy to there send them go. to you to see what, what magic you make with them. Yeah, that would be, there that would go. be awesome. So now because you're obviously sewing these fabrics, do you have a preference between hand sewing them or using a machine? I have to use a machine. Um, they, because they're woven, hand sewing them is just not going to secure these fibers. And I do back a lot of them with something called SF101 if anybody wants to get into this type of stuff, which is just a, a non-woven interfacing. But even then, I really want secure bonds. A lot of what I'm making is bags and things like that. And bags just get filled with more and more and more, more stuff. And they get kind of heavy. So I tend to almost do everything except for finish work by machine. Okay, that's that's really amazing. Just because I know um, myself and machines don't really talk well to each other. So, do you have any maybe like tips or suggestions about machines or your favorite machine right. for someone that might be like a beginner or you know doing right. this kind of work? So I always I get asked this question a lot: What machine should I buy? And my general answer is anything over three hundred dollars. And that's just because um, there's really not anything less than that that's not going to make it harder for you. And you'll end up angry and walking away from your machine um, because, and it's not really you issue. It's not really even a machine issue. It's just kind of like, oh, this is, this is an, an, you know, an item that's designed not to give you the product that you as a fiber artist probably want. So my short answer is anything over $300. My somewhat longer answer is go to Costco and get it. Okay. because if there's something wrong with it, Costco has a great return policy. And there are lemons. Bernina, which is like top of the line luxury, 
they have problems. Janome is my favorite. Um, and Janome will have a lemon every once in a while. And being able to just return that is really nice. The other thing I would tell people about their machines is there's less to adjust on the machine than you think and more to do with the feet. Um, a lot of people get like, oh, my fiber won't feed through or it's bunching or it's doing all these things and all this stuff. And almost all of that doesn't have to do with your tension or anything else like that. It has to do with you're using the foot that came with the machine. And it's like having the wrong orifice on your spinning wheel and trying to spin art for art yarn. It won't do you any good or the wrong tension or something like that. So I grabbed three little feet here really quick. This is my favorite. If you're working with thicker stuff and you're wanting to make bags and not make a quilt or something like that, this is called a walking foot. And it looks, when you put it on your machine, this one is actually for a, um, either a brother or a singer, probably interchangeable. And you put this on your machine and it attaches and it has like this little alligator clip thing there. Okay. And it just like chompa, 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 chompas along your fabric and it feeds it through. So you're not sitting there trying to push it through. If it's really thick, it just grabs it and does it for you. And this is the single biggest game changer. I use this even when I'm working with quilting fabric with my mom. Like this thing will change your world. Um, they also make Teflon feet. Which, okay. and these are, these are all less than $10, $10, And this Teflon foot is also a game changer if you're using different types of fabric. It just kind of slides underneath it and makes it a lot easier. So that's what I always tell people is like buy a $300 machine or more. You don't need, a, I would say between three and seven. You don't need bigger than that. I took me years to upgrade to the thousands, like, you know, years and years and years. And then also check, learn to use your different feet um, because that's really, if you're having issues, chances are pretty good. It has to do with the feet and not with the machine or with you. Yeah, often I find that um, working on a sewing machine is very similar to warping a loom where mm -hmm. if you haven't done it for a while, you have to sit with the manual and you have to really just kind of get into this headspace. Mm -hmm. Okay, like no one interrupts me or talk to me because I have right. to like relearn this thing. And then mm -hmm. once you kind of get past that um, stage of not talking to it and you're like, oh, okay, I think I got this to work, then it's not so bad, but it's that initial jumping yeah. in. So do you either teach lessons on how to sew or do you know like where you would recommend someone go to learn how to use their machine? So most of the sewing machine stores and even Joann's offer pretty good lessons. Okay. Um, I would also say YouTube is a great place um, for the very beginner stuff. Like one of my favorite lessons when people say, okay, what do I need to do? Go get some wrapping paper oh. and don't sew fabric. So wrapping paper. And so if you get a plaid, learn to sew a straight line, straight lining. Don't even, you don't have to thread your machine. You don't have to have a bobbin. So learn one skill at a time. And that's one of my favorite first ones to do. And it's the one my mom did with me when I was, you know, six or seven of, you know, in her face saying, teach me to sew. She's like, okay, here's some wrapping paper. And if particularly if you're into, you want to do your own quilting or things like that, get, get a floral print and learn to follow the floral print with your machine. Um, but all those kind of really big beginner stuff that's available on YouTube, how to thread your machine, which is kind of big um, and it's kind of hard and intimidating. I will say the newer ones, they've put arrows on it for those of us who forget, nice, nice. Um, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so those are kind of the places I personally don't teach right now um, between the farm and I, we're also a bee farm. So I'm about to go into honey season and the sewing studio. I'm not teaching anybody other than, you know, <laughs> my kids most days. And that's kind of iffy. Yeah, yeah, I know that, that that part can definitely be touch and go, but that that to me is is such a great tip with using the the paper, yeah. especially without having a thread, and to kind of break it down into smaller parts. And the right. part that you were saying too, even having the arrows, like when people are learning how to drop spindle, sometimes they'll spin the spindle in different directions. So I always take masking tape and draw like a little yeah. arrow, and I'm like, okay, we're always gonna go in this direction just to yeah. remember. And then once you know your body understands and your brain understands how all the pieces and parts work together other than it's less intimidating. And I know yeah. you said that you do the continuous weaving. So I've done something with um, a triangle loom where so, I've made a, a yeah. shawl like that, but do you ever make continuous weavings and then sew them together like how you do yeah. fabrics or? 
Yeah, um, it does require me. So continues, you know, it's a little bit more open. So what I'll do is a double strand with it. Okay. And then when I go to set it, I'll actually almost felt it a little bit so okay. that it's really a much more firm um, because continuous strand can be really flowing and loose and open and it's, it's very beautiful. Um, so if I do that, if there's other continuous strand weavers, just double up your yarn and use something that's grippy. So make sure it has a little bit of wool in it if you can. And then, yeah. And so what do you, the things that you make on it is just for personal or do you also sell the things that you weave on there? I sell them. They take a very long time to make. So I make about 15 a year. <laughs> so as opposed to like 15 bags in two weeks, I'll make 15 of those, you know, one or two a month. I get a little busy in the summer because I can stand outside and do it. Um, but so I do sell them, but they're, they're usually the commissions or I, I just say, here's this one thing I have and then it sells that way. Yeah, that that's that's really cool. I um when when I when I took this class on doing it, I was really fascinated by the fact that you're warping and weaving at the same time. So for those people that are not into warping and they just like the weaving part, that's you know an awesome way of doing it. So do you do you use the the bigger um type of looms or do you a, a smaller one? Because I know they have different sizes, right? Right. So I have a really really huge, probably six feet by two feet rectangle. And I make okay. great shawls out of it. I also have a three foot um, triangle and a seven foot triangle that's adjustable. And I'll make little hats on the little three foot one. And then the seven foot one are those triangle shawls that make you feel like the happiest witch on earth. It's like, oh, nice, nice. Yeah. so yeah. Cool. Well, well, thank you for sharing that part um, about yeah. your, your, your creating with us. Um, so going back to the animals, because I thought that was really interesting right. too, that you said that you re rehabilitate animals. So right. where, where do you get these animals from? I mean, do you, do you buy them right. and they're like half off literally or like, right. Yes. Yes. Literally <laughs> and metaphorically. Um, I, in a lot of the fiber communities and groups, there'll be an animal that almost always has great fiber, but, mm -hmm. and, and people will post those or they'll, they'll comment about those or they'll communicate about those. And then somebody says, you know, who takes those animals and I'll get a message like, Oh, I have this beautiful Shetland sheep, but she's missing an eyeball. So and I'm like, oh, well, we don't need all our eyeballs here. One's good. Um, and then I, you know, I kind of think about the different ones. Like I had a, my, one of my very first ones was a type A pygora who was always matted. And so, and the lady was like, do you want this animal? She's like, his fiber is too fine. It's gross. Well, it turned out all he needed was kelp. Um, and he's got beautiful fiber now, but he came in and he was just a dumpster fire. I was like, oh, that's bad. And we call him the BOGO goat. So I bought one from her and I got him free. Um, you know, so we have all sorts of different ones. I have one that's like this South Down Shetland cross, who's basically the size of a bus. Her name's Betty. And she doesn't baw, she goes, wong. It sounds like a fog, a fog horn. And she is so neurotic. Like her eyeballs point in different directions and she's always, you know, but she's great. And she has this really fun, fabulous, like elastic style um, wool. So, yeah, but she is the size of a bus. So it just, it just kind of depends. And people will reach out to me. A lot of people are like, oh, I'm retiring. And I have these animals that I love and I don't want them to go to auction. And I'm like, bring them on over. Why not? What's one more? So, um, so how so many they, animals do you have then? Don't, it, it was my, okay, so my husband can't see this video. You don't, have to, you don't have to say it out loud. <laughs> I know, right? You need to be quiet, sorry. <laughs> right. Um, one, one should so, ever ask the size of one flock, my, forgive me. Exactly. I think we're, I think we have about 23 right now. Um, we got, we, this year was pretty quiet here. We only ended up with two extras and one is this daughter of this Angora goat who's beautiful and delicate and lovely. And then her mom, who is crazy. She never, and so my animals don't make noises. Animals that are happy or are fed, or, they don't make a lot of noises. So, but this name is named Piper and Piper just stands out in fields yelling and looking around. <laughs> like oh so so yeah it just this year we only added two so I think we have about 21 22 animals it's been a pretty quiet couple of years so in in picking up all of these like ragtag animals and you know all, all of this, right. this this motley crew that you're assembling um do you find that they kind of are born with these quirks or is it maybe just that the the um people that had them weren't really sure what to do with them or like is it the animal's fault is it the because i'm not really a shepherd and right. i know much about this so like is it is the the love and the care that you put into these animals does that 
um, right. you know, make them kind of like bring them back to normal, so to speak, or? Um, you know, I don't, I've never had one that I feel like was traumatized. So okay. I, I don't know about that. I will say that they are born with very distinct personalities. The Angora goats in particular, they're a lot like goat elephants. They have this social structure. It's a matriarchy. There's a queen. She usually has like second in command. They love their daughters and only their daughters. And, you know, and they have this amazing social structure and they're born into it. Um, and I have, I would say I have this ma matriarchy line it starts with my girl Guinevere and it goes down. And there's this year, her daughter's name is Scully. And then her granddaughter's name is River. Well, this is the queen line. So Scully's next in line and she will most likely be the next queen unless somebody challenges her, which I doubt. But her daughter River has no interest in being a crown princess. She is just off in the field with the flowers all the time. She's not bossy. She's So it's a lot of that is born. Um, I did get a, a hold of ones once that were from like a, a too densely popular, I, you could call it a hoarding case. But the very strange thing was that these are very tame animals. This person loved their animals. They just got out of control. She had too many. And they didn't learn to compete for food. And if you know anything about goats, that's all they do. Like that's their number one hobby is like food, food, you know, and, and competing for it. It could be food everywhere. And they're like, oh, pick a fight over that bowl. <laughs> and these, this set that I got from them, they didn't learn. So they just stand and wait patiently. And I'm like, oh, guys, <laughs> you're going to have to step it up. <laughs> but in those cases, we just put those in a separate stall. We do have to kind of manage that kind of stuff. So those that team goes to a separate stall and just eats casually on their own, which is fine. It's not a big deal. So yeah, so like I know with pets, um, just because I'm not familiar with goats, so it's okay. if, you, if you can, if you can um, educate me on this, because I know um, I'm familiar with cats and I know that cats tend to have their person, right? So you can right. be um, in a house with a bunch of people and one cat will pick their person and maybe right. they'll be nice to everyone else, but this is their person. So for you and having these goats, is there one goat that either really gloms onto you or is there one animal that they just have such a quirky personality that that's like your animal? So I don't, are you a Harry Potter fan? Um, you know, I'm, it's I mean, a, I've, I've seen, I've seen the first I one. Forgive yeah. you, you know. So yeah. I have one goat who is what I, what's the Ravenclaw, which is the thinking group. And her name is Morgan. Morgan came to me with meningeal worm, which is a, goes into their spine and paralyzes them. So we had wow. her like isolated, but she recovered and she now walks with a limp and we call Morgan. She's, she's this, you know, kind of isolated thinking she's part of the group she's the second in command of my queen she's got this she's a cash for so she's one eighth cashmere and the rest is angora she's this beautiful silver um coat all the other goats come up for scritches and love and everything like that and we say morgan has a no peanut no touch policy so <laughs> she cannot pet morgan until you have an offering it's not that she's scared she just demands an offering and she's my girl i love her um she's she's just kind of my favorite she's she's very regal very solemn very solid um and and just a really a really fun goat she's got a lot of personality so she's my girl now there are others i think that probably prefer more me more than she prefers me but she's the one i like the most so well it's it sounds it sounds like a, a really um interesting dynamic and relationship that you have not only with morgan but with all of your yeah. your animals so thank you for for sharing that with us so the last question for today, because for the previous two um, Fiverside chats, they were holidays, right? It was President's Day and Valentine's Day. So I thought it would be fun to see what other um, national holidays are going on today. And I know one of the holidays is National Sword Swallowing Day, but unfortunately, <laughs> neither of us have any interesting or cool stories about swallowing swords. Um, maybe my husband has stepped on a needle that I left out. So right. there's maybe that part. I don't know if that's, you know, part of the sword swallowing bit. But one of the the, the funny um, holidays that's that's going on today, it's it's actually public sleeping day. So sleeping in public right. is a holiday. Right. And, and I was asking you about that. And you said you had stories about sleeping in public in college. Right. So mm -hmm. I went to college for a very long time, um, <laughs> like six years. But I also was that generation. We had to work when we went to college. So I, I worked um, either second or third shift and then went to college during the day and mostly like I just moved around the campus from class to nap space to class to nap space and I think there's probably like 
that's it that's it that's my college like knowledge of me was like that's the girl that slept over there <laughs> and over there but I was in school for a very long time and and you know it was it was in my defense I was working and you know but I've definitely I feel like everybody who's gone to college has slept in public more than a few times so yeah well and, and just even you know being a, a parent and oh, right. you know, you're you're like up with your kid all night and then you have to go to work and you're like okay I'm just gonna go to a quiet corner I'm gonna set my <laughs> phone or alarm or whatever five minutes I'm just gonna go right. like this you know pretend that like I had a rough day so if anyone walks into my cubicle or whatever they're just gonna you know think that I'm putting my head down or something like that so yeah, yeah. I think that like those first weeks after they're born and you're, you know, you're driving and there's a kid, I'm pretty sure I was asleep while in public while driving, you know, when they're newborns, like, that was one long asleep in public. So. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember what um, I was doing necessarily in those first two weeks are, they're kind of a blur, right. but I know that there were times where my mother-in-law was saying to me, whatever you do, don't sleep with the baby in the bed. And I know there's different people that have oh. different you know, thoughts and, and opinions about co-sleeping and, and all of that. But um, in trying to keep my son safe and myself sane, I remember just taking my hands and kind of like making a little circle like around him, you know, and I'm like, okay, I'm yeah. not sleeping. I'm just closing my eyes. We're just going to lay here and I'm going to reach out as best as I can. So. Exactly. I think I did the same thing. I was like, well, okay. Well, especially with three, can... I couldn't even imagine. Right. Like, yeah. yeah like, okay. <laughs> this is, this is safer in the bed than any other options. So. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to just go and see if there are any other questions okay. or comments in the chat and I will let you know. Sure. Um, okay. So let's see here. Um, Okay, so Lynn said that a demo of that type would be fantastic. So I think she was referring to mm -hmm. the pin weaving. So if I'm incorrect, just let me know. Um, let's see if there's any other questions. Oh, okay. I think, let's see. So yeah, so someone else, um, Angela said, I used a wrap with my babies. Yeah, it's definitely something that I didn't know about when I was younger, growing up or seeing people do, I, I grew up in Brooklyn, but now definitely getting older right. and, you know, you have these Facebook groups and, and Ravelry mm -hmm. and like all these places with these mm -hmm. um, moms sharing tips and stuff like that. Yeah. So that's really a huge um, com community way to like help new mothers. And, and again, yeah. the fact, going back to the fact that you're using these fabrics in order to make your, your bags, I just, I, I think that's so cool. Okay, let's see there's a lot hand. of a lot of weavers who make them there's a lot of hand weavers. so I'm wondering if anybody in WAPA is a, a wrap weaver be interesting to find out yeah I'll see if anyone if anyone posts about that um just yeah so just Angela said that um I used a wrap with my babies um and then they said our local tech school has an amazing adult sewing education program so mm -hmm. that's that's another great resource too yeah. I know that um I have these local like community you know books for mm -hmm. for different activities like for kids to go to camp and things like that right. so I wonder if they they have um sewing classes in other people's local community activities yeah. probably like at libraries and things like that right mm -hmm. there's a lot of libraries that have arts um lending centers now they have you oh. know just maker they call them maker rooms and they'll have sewing machines in there that people can go and use and things like that as well as the community colleges and I know in Seattle our community centers would teach it it was as well as some of the senior centers would teach it and they don't card you for your age at the senior center they don't seem to mind so so you know you've got options you've got a lot of options so yeah, I feel I feel like the the discounts or the bonuses are if you're in school and you're and you're young right. or if you're older. But us like middle age folk, forget right. it. We have to we have to put the whole <laughs> entire right. bill. Um, so so yeah, someone said oh pin pin weaving. So they wanted to mm -hmm. see yeah, I guess the yeah. continuous the continuous weaving. Um, and then Juliet says I ran a tri loom lister group for many years and have several tri looms too. So yeah, so I guess that's a, a popular mm -hmm. um, type of equipment in in the group from those yeah. that are watching. So yeah, so if anyone has any more questions for for Annie about her weavings, her her mm -hmm. fabric collection, or her purses or anything like that, please feel free to just go ahead and tag her in the comments because um, we are going to end this third fiber side mm -hmm. chat, but we're happy to yeah. come back and check in to see if anyone has any questions. And for those of you that would be interested in joining the next one, I'm going to be interviewing Robin Nistock of Nistock Farms, and I'm going to be interviewing her on March 14th. So we're gonna skip next Monday 
And then we're going to come back the following Monday after that. So I've put an event up in the Wool and Fiber Arts group. So you can go ahead and click on that is going and it will send you um, an alert to let you know when we're about to go live. And this recording, if you came in later or if you're like watching or if you want to watch the replay, this will be up indefinitely. So you can just go ahead, search the group for the hashtag Fiberside Chat and you should be able to watch all of the interviews. So Annie, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Such a pleasure to hear about, you know, Morgan and um, the, the wrapping paper tip, all of these great resources and, and, and tips that you shared with us today. So thank you so much. I really appreciate no your time. Thank you. All right. Take care.